So the book first start to talk about like types in computer science. is like it's just a subcategory of like what we call the formal method where we want to ensure that a system behaves correctly um like but on one end of the spectrum uh powerful frameworks like whole logic, algebraic specification languages, model logic and denotational semantics. But yeah, not seeing uh, like too academic for us. So at least in this book, we will not talk about these topics. And at the other end, there are techniques that um, much more modest, like compilers, linkers, and the programmer analyzers can use them and programmers will use them in day-to-day -day lives. And the prominent example in this case is what we call the type system. And, and the, her book talks about type systems, basically. And the book start to mention uh, definition of the type system as a tractable syntactic method for proving the absence of certain program behavior by classifying phrases according to a kind of value they compute. So, so this is kind of really a really dense sentence and the book explained that a little bit further. First, uh, type system uh, tools to reason about programs. So we don't we don't care about like just pure theory math that much in this book, but. The type system or type theory can be can be like fit, uh, fit into a larger picture in logic, in math, and in philosophy. And in this book, we mainly care about for programming languages. And the book further comment that in computer science, there are two major branches of studying the two major branches of studying the type systems. The more practical one is the one we care about, which concerns the application to programming languages. And the more abstract one focus on something like pure typed lambda calculi and the variety of logic while the curry hold in correspondence. Those things, those things are fun, but also not that relevant to programmers. But there are some similar to the concept notations and techniques used by both communities. Also, the orientation is different um, for, for example, researches on typed lambda calculi put a huge focus on termination. So a program must terminate. 
while most pro most programming languages don't have this property, yeah, for stuff like recursive function definition. When we say the word that a programming language is Turing complete, which most known programming languages are, even Excel sheets are Turing complete. We means that a program is not necessary to terminate, uh, for example, a loop, just write, write a simple loop and it's possible to just run forever. And the, and the compiler can't guarantee its termination. And another thing of the important thing about the definition is that it's a classification of terms, syntactic phrases, according to the property of the values they will compute when executing. So usually in a programming language, we will have those kind of things we call expressions, which I'm sure the book will talk about later. And then, expressions compute to some values and each value will have a type. And that's when we, what we are talking about, we will do some classifications of the type, but also aesthetically. So we don't need to run the program to, and just use the type system to infer some behavior of the program. And the word static is sometimes to add explicitly. So instead of saying like typed programming language or, or untyped programming language, we explicitly say statically typed programming language. And for untyped, we call them dynamically typed. Or, or latent type, but I think this term is this term is not much used for languages like for language like Scheme or Python, JavaScript, and those are all dynamically typed. Where for each object there is a runtime type text in the interpreter that they use to distinguish different kinds of structures, what, what kind of thing that object is. And the book says that dynamically types are arguably a misnomer, which I, I, I heard other people mentioned that too, but also this term is ubiquitous nowadays. Usually you say dynamically typed, people know what you are talking about using other terms, like for example, dynamically checked, then people don't know what you are talking about. But yeah, dynamically typed basically means the language implementation will check We'll do type checking at runtime. And if and for static type systems, unlike those dynamically typed languages, the the type system need to be conservative because we lack information about runtime. If we read some file, for example, then at, before running the program, we have no idea what that is. So type system in that case can only prove the absence of some bad programming behaviors.
But they must. They must uh, like sometimes reject the reject program that is that will actually well behave well at runtime. For example, in this case, uh, if if else branch where the else branch result in some kind of type error in languages like Python, then this is totally fine. But in a statically typed language, then if we have something like this, the compiler will not able to decide what the result of complex text is. So it must reject this program because it we want to have a value from this if if else construct, but in one branch, we have five. In another branch, we have an error and we don't know what will happen. So even if really this tab, this test will always be true, we, the compiler cannot know that. And there is also a trade-off between like conservativity and expressiveness. So when designing a type system, so how how much valid program you want to reject, how much like false negative you want, versus how how much bad programs you want to catch. There are this trade-off here. So a related point here is that most, most type systems with like straightforward analysis can't cap, capture arbitrary undesirable programming behaviors. So they can only guarantee that real type of program are free of certain kinds of errors. Like most type system can statically track the arguments of arithmetic operations are always numbers. Or just uh, in general, they can track the arguments of a function. But for division by zero, we know most statically typed language will leave that at runtime because there are just no way to handle that. Also, array access, usually type systems just can't handle that. They just leave that at runtime. And I'm not sure about this sentence, like the bad behaviors that can be eliminated by type system are often called runtime type errors. I feel like this is this is opposite with what I have in mind, but whatever. And there is the idea of the safety of the soundness of each type system, which must judge by its own set of errors.
And another aspect of a type system is that it it are not restricted to check only low level stuff. It can check more high level stuff like modularities and abstractions. So for example, information heading, uh, information heading like so a lot of object oriented languages, there are those like keywords like public or private. And this is enforced by the type system that you cannot access private data at will. And this paragraph talks about that type trackers must do their job automatically without intervention. There's no in manual intervention with programmers, but still sometimes it needs help. And it's in form of type annotations. Different programming languages have different preference on one spectrum. We have languages like C or Java, where it's, we need to be explicit about every type. And the other spectrum, we have languages like ML, which can infer most of the types. And the last paragraph talks about we're not we're mostly interested in methods that are not just automatically in principle, but also come with a efficient algorithm for tracking for tracking errors. But of course, this efficiency is a matter of debate. For example, the one used by ML is usually very fast, but we can construct a pathological program that will have a huge type tracking time. I think the complex worst case complexity of this kind of algorithm is like O of N cube or something. So it's, it can be very bad, but in usual cases, in average, on average, or like practically on every program human will write, it will be pretty fast. And that's good enough for us. Yeah, there are even language with type tracking or type, type reconstruction problem that are undecidable. Talking about language like C++ or Rust, which the type system itself is Turing complete, so it itself may never terminate. But the algorithms are available to halt quickly for most cases of practical interest. Now we're going to 1.2, what type systems are good for detecting errors, which yeah, this is um, obvious goal. And when people come from a dynamically typed language to something that's more typed, for example, people add type annotation to JavaScript, we get something like TypeScript and also for Python, people also start to add type annotations because we want to detect certain kind of programming errors and type system can do that.
App system can also help abstraction in we previously talks about public and private, and that is the case. It's one of the cases that type system can help abstraction and modularity. And the book talk about module languages, which is used in the ML family. which also is a way to provide abstractions. Also, type systems are useful for documentation. For static type language, when we read a program with type of annotations, they, then we have some idea what's going on with that program. And one good thing is that other form of documentation comments can always be out of sync with the actual code. But type count because if type is out of sync, then the program won't compile. Also, type system can ensure the safety of the programming language, even though the books mentioned that the term safe language is very contentious. Ask nine, ask nine out of 10 people on the internet to talk about safety of programming language to give a definition they probably can't. <laughs> they just feel like their programming language is safe. But informally, I think that's enough. Informally, the safe language uh, are just one that make it impossible to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> and I think the books give a good definition which say a safe language is one that protects its own abstraction. So every program language have certain abstractions. For example, array and a safe program language will protect that. Where on um, language like C, you can just access array out of bound and to, to just happily do that. And whatever can happen, we don't know. It also talks about language safety is not the same thing as the type safety. Because yeah, language safety can be achieved by type system, uh, static tracking by type safety, but also certain cases, as we said before, it's impossible for a type system to check. So we can use runtime tracks that trap nonsensical operations. And then the so-called unsafe languages usually also have a static type checker that's eliminate a lot of errors, but it can't provide some guarantees. So they become so-called unsafe. And this is kind of the category that they also put it here. We have safe language, unsafe, and then we have statically typed and dynamically typed, which is a separate concept with whether it's safe or not, because everything can be checked dynamically. And notice 
we pretty much don't have a bottom bottom right here because once once like once we have runtime type tracking expensive runtime a lot of expensive tracking then there are no reason to still have unsafe escape hatch the all unsafe escape hatch in language like c and c++ exist because we want some performance benefit even though they not they are not always the case to provide performance but at least that's what we want and for those languages, we are already have an expensive runtime, so there are no reason to leave them as, as unsafe. And and you may ask that where is JavaScript? <laughs> and and I think JavaScript, yeah, some of its rules are really weird, but still it is well defined. So I guess it's still in the safe cat category at least by this author's definition, just like the, well, what is considered a safe language is very contentious. And yes, static typing alone usually can't can't guarantee a runtime type safety. For example, array bound checking. I usually check dynamically. And a lot of languages has escape hatches. Like OCaml has this called obj.magic. Standard ML has unsafe cast. Modular three and C sharp has uh, an unsafe sub language net intended to implementing low level runtime facilities with the keyword unsafe. And nowadays, I guess the most famous example of this is Rust which has an unsafe subset. But usually people stays in the normal subset, which doesn't allow unsafe operations. And this paragraph talks about this different perspective, which The, so runtime errors can be seen as trapped and untrapped, and a safe language will always trapped runtime error cause the computation to stop immediately. The untrapped error just go undetected and the computation just start to continue at least for a while. Usually there are other protection mechanisms in place. So in a C++ program, if you may meet a segbot at some point, but the real runtime error probably happens earlier. And another point of view is safe language is defined by a safe language is completely defined by the menu in the spec. And so in this perspective, language like C certainly doesn't like that because it explicitly leaves a lot of stuff as undefined. So after talking about safety, the last point of type system is efficiency. Because it 
just with the type with the type system we can we can easily compile efficient program and without types a type system it is usually very difficult and even even in dynamically typed language a good implementation a fast implementation also do just in time compil compilation and try its best to recover some type information Here is some further applications of non-traditional use, usage of type systems, but I guess we will skip this part. And for here, it talks about retrofitting a type system onto a language not designed with type tracking in mind is tricky. For example, TypeScript design is very complex to retrofit into JavaScript. And also type, type in Python is tremendously difficult. And the huge reason of that is languages without a type system tend to offer features or uh, encourage program idioms that make type tracking difficult. So both Python and JavaScript has certain dynamic features that are very hard to track at statically. For example, an object you can just add different field and met even method at runtime. Those kind of things are just hard to check. And 1.4 is a brief history of development of type system. I guess we will skip that. In the sake of time, but here, here are some very interesting stuff here. For example, like system F and polymorphic lambda calculus, which nowadays we know that basically the same thing. And we talked about in the previous book in the practical foundation of program languages. And I think we will also talk about it in this book, but much later. There are also a lot of related reading. Notice that this book was published pretty early in 2002. So nowadays there are even more related reading uh, various of this kind of topics. So we are done with chapter one. Any questions before we go into chapter two? All right, let's start. I had one question. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the book talks about language safety and type safety. I didn't understand what is language safety. Like, isn't type safe same as uh, language safety? So... So... It talks about language safety. It's a very contentious concept. It's more like informal term, term people talks about. And no one have a clear idea what that is. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The book just talks about a safe. Give the definition. A safe language is the one that protects its own abstraction. This is the definition that the book gives, and yeah, different people certainly have very different idea of what is called safe. Yeah, I guess. That yeah. Makes also, sense. yeah. Also, also there is a comment that in the yeah in the chat about mm. language safety encompasses more aspect than type safety. Yeah, certainly. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Like concurrency. Yeah, not only memory and thread safety. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Type safety, type safety. If you check, if you go to check the definition, what that is, it is more like the type system is self-contained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think if a language is type safe, it is probably pretty much means it's memory safe. But for things like thread safety, then certainly. A type system can just be like totally oblivious to the existence of thread. For example, Java, mm. it was designed before like threading was a thing. So yeah, I guess for majority of programming languages like that, it's type system doesn't know anything about thread. And so it can't guarantee anything. Mm. Also in <laughs> case, for example, JavaScript, yeah, we, yeah, the, it's it's everything is well defined in JavaScript, but in some cases where people say like it is really weird, you can add a number and a string. Is that really what you want? Yeah. Even though this is well defined. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, no problem. <laughs> Let's start talk about chapter two. We yeah we can leave some further discussions after we finish those two chapters. Let's just mention that this chapter is really terse. So if you are not familiar with those topics, then don't expect to read this chapter and to understand it. That's not enough. And yeah, it's not your fault if you can't understand this chapter. So Gilson mentioned this book called Discrete Mathematics and its Applications. Yeah, so what what this book talks about um, set theories, which is usually taught in a discrete math course in university. So reading a book in discrete math will cover those topics. So first it's just talk about some notations of sets, which is pretty standard. Everything is pretty standard here. And a set of natural number n. Notice the book's natural number start from zero, which mathematicians with countless time debating whether natural number should start from zero or one. And people still haven't decided different books use different ways, but this book starts from zero. And then this concept of countability. A set, is set, a set is said to be countable if its elements can be placed in a one-to-one correspondence with natural numbers. For example, integers, like negative numbers are still countable because we still can one-to-one -one map to 
natural numbers. Even even fractions, the not fractions, rational numbers. There are a way to map them to natural numbers. And you may you may feel it's a bit weird because rational numbers sounds like a lot more than natural numbers, but remember that they are both infinite. So it can still we can still do a one-to-one -one mapping. On the other hand, real numbers with those irrationals are uncountable because yeah, we just can't have this kind of one-to-one -one current correspondence anymore. And then the book talks a lot about relation, which is not, not well covered in a lot of those discrete math text. So if you are not familiar with this concept, but everything else, then yeah, probably you can read this part to understand a bit more. So first start from M place relation. On a collection of sets, it's just a, just a set where its space is like in, um, Cartesian product. Yeah, in the Cartesian, pro yeah, in the Cartesian product. And then it talks about the first uh, one place relation. So one place relation is just has one set. Um, just on uh, one set, it's called we call them a predicate. And we say that predicate is true if the element is in the in the city in in this uh in in the relation set of course if the predicate uh if the element is in our uh set s but not in the predicate there is false and we often write its notation like that instead of instead of like s in p and in that case we say we are mean that instead of treating it as a relation we treat it as a as a function that map elements to true and false And we also has binary relations. Which is on two sets. So we often write binary relation like this as RT instead of ST is in R. And this place, you can think about binary relation examples like equal or greater than, for example, are some examples of binary relations. And in some cases, those two sets are the same. And then we say that that's a relation, the binary relation is on just on this single set. We don't distinguish those two anymore. And in here, it talk about three and more place relations are often written in some mixed phase 
syntax. I guess it depends on their specific meaning. For example, we can we will write those kind of things, which which we, is familiar for people who read that Harper's book, but you know, we will talk about those kind of things later in this book too, but not in this chapter. Also for binary relations, we can have domain and codomain and range. I'm surprised the codomain and range in here are exactly the same. There's an erratum for that. The what? So there's a list of errors in the book and he's put a comment about that saying, yeah, mostly people don't use range in that way. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I think this definition is technically correct for range, though, because the set of elements T, it's, it is the set of elements that T, such that ST is in R. That is the range. The codomain yeah, sorry, can be the any. codomain was the thing that yeah, was wrong. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Codomain sorry. can be any superset of the range. Yeah. I'll, I'll put a link to the actual errata. Yeah, yeah. Also, do notice domain and codomain. We are still not talking about functions yet. Those are for those are for relations, and some of relations are functions. It talks about some of relations, are partial functions. Where we have. We, uh, we, if we have this, okay, the terminology is not standard. Yeah, the codomains and ranges. Are, are different. And in, yeah, you hear, you hear they are lumped together. Also, some of the partial functions can be total functions if the domain of the relation is exactly s, which means which means for every everything in set as we can always put them into this function. That's a crucial difference between partial function where certain inputs don't have an output. And then it talks about for for partial function, for partial function, there is an idea of defined for an argument as if it is in the domain, otherwise it's undefined. And there is this notation to denote whether X is de defined in F. And for total function, then everything, everything in S is defined. and preserved by
Okay, so the idea of preserved by is that you can always get the argument of this binary relation into the predicate. And it is still in the domain of the predicate. Then it talk, also talks about order set. Those are also things people normally don't think too much about because usually when we deal with numbers, it's just intuitive, it has a total order. But also in, it's not always the case. For example, in reality, floating point numbers don't have a total order, for example. It has NAN, and we usually just ignore that. So if we want to be more formal, we need to talk about those kind of stuff. And a couple of definitions reflex, reflexive. Which means, which means like SRS, or we can write the relation, the pair for the same input is always in the relation set. And R is symmetric if S R T implies T R S for all S and T, because it's for all S and T and S and T is in the same set. Like this imply can, yeah, it can't even be replaced with if and only if, because those two are basically interchangeable now. And for transitive, Transitive, we basically have S, R, T, and T, R, U. Together implies S, R, U. And finally, there is an anti symmetric property, which is like SRT and TRS, so like we change the order implies that S and T are the same element. So if you find this notation to be very obtuse because of using of R here, I, when I read this part, I find one mental trick to do is to replace R with some specific relation in mind, for example, equal or uh, greater than, less than, and try to read this paragraph again. And then it's very helpful to get those properties. And then he talks about a reflexive and transitive relation is called a pre-order. It's writing, it's writing like this. This is less than or equal to, I don't know what this is. And strict less than is just like less than equal and not same element. And built from pre-order, if we add anti-symmetric, we get a partial order. And we, 
if we have to, if we just for each s and if we have this property for each s and t s we have we always have the order basically then it's called total order The idea of least join or least upper bound, I think this upper bound and greatest lower bound are most used, more used term because I never heard of join and meet before this book. It's pretty common in like order theoretic talk. In order theory. Yeah, because I guess yeah. I, I don't, I, I never studied order theory, just hmm. instead of seeing well. like other branch of math using those ter those terms are more commonly used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In analysis, they use least upper bound or yeah. greater upper bound. Yeah. Yeah, also talk about equivalence. The notice the difference is reflexive and transitive is the same, but instead of have anti-symmetric, we have symmetric. Remember the symmetric is that SRT implies TRS. So think about, for example, less, less than we certainly one less than other don't imply the opposite, but for equal then one equal other implies other, a equal b equal to imply b equal to a. It's the same thing. And then we talk about the idea of this reflexive closure, transitive closure. And it also is the smallest subset of our relations that satisfy this property. Nice, I will, I will read that later. Yes, we will skip those exercises. Though for later part of the book, we will probably consider to do that, but for set theories, it's just a review, and if we later later meet problems in that area, we can always read back. But I don't think we should spend too much time on this chapter now. And here is an idea of decreasing chain, which is another term I never heard of. The idea is pretty straightforward that if we have a pre-order set, if we have a pre-order on a set and then we have a sequence, then if the, if the sequence, the 
like each number in the sequence is always strictly less than its predecessor. And again, if we have a pre-order, we and we say that it is well-founded well if it contains no infinite decreasing chain. So for example, natural numbers, Natural numbers is well founded because we we can decrease to zero and we need to stop. But for integers, integers is the different story. It is not well founded because we can just keep decreasing. So one thing I'll mention is that like it seems like maybe this is coming out of nowhere. Like it's well founded, but like well founded is equivalent to being able to do uh, induction on the relation, and so that's why it's brought up here. Oh, yeah, yeah, real right. That's some deep insight. Yeah, so when we do mathematical induction, we often talk using natural numbers. So that's all connected. Okay, so, so this is just the definition of sequence, which is not too much interesting. And it's we most talk about notations. And 2.4 is induction which is ubiquitous is used in programming languages. Then we want to prove something, but also in a lot of other fields, in computer science and also just in math, this, it is induction is used a lot with different kinds of inductions. So in here, we only talk about mathematical inductions and I guess different induction, other inductions will be introduced later in this book. And there's this version of induction, which we have a base case and then we have, we have this case, we have an induction case. We need we need to prove we need to prove if those two hold then this hold basically. And we have this complete induction, which in as, at least where I learned that it's all it's called in my source it's called strong induction. The difference is that in the pre in the conditions that in here in here is pi implies pi plus one. In in here in here we basically need all of those pi's from. from zero to n to show pn. No, zero to m, m minus one. So it's p zero, p one, until p m minus one to show pn. Both are equally valid. And this is a stronger, this is a bigger hammer than this, but this is simpler to use, so. 
only if only if sometimes probably we find this is not powerful enough, we need to use this. Lexical graphics order or dictionary order. Just yeah, just think about how we order words in a dictionary, which is exactly what this is about. So a question about why. Two dot four point two don't have if p zero. Yeah, and it's also answered in the chat, which is that because in here we said give all p i for all i less than n, which is start from p zero. It's p zero, p one, p two, etc. To p m minus one, it's already include p zero. And yeah, we still need to show P zero because yeah, in here for each natural number N, notice this statement here, which includes zero. Which, but in that case, this given just don't have any effect. Lexicographic induction is I just use the lexicographics order to establish induction for a pair, but I guess it can be also used for more, even more amount of natural numbers. It can be generalized to triples and four tuples, etc. Later chapters will introduce structural induction, but we will not talk about it today. In chapter 21, we will also see all those induction principle uh, instances of a single deep idea. I don't know what that is, but chapter 21 is a long time. We will wait to see what that is later. Yeah, that's it. We covered the two chapters today. Um, I have a question. What is the difference between uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric properties? Because from the notation, it looks the same to me. Let's go back. So think about a specific case, uh, less than or equal, just this as a relation. It is not symmetric. S less than or equal to T doesn't imply T less than or equal to S. Mm -hmm. 
like one less than or equal to two, but two is not less than or equal to one. But it is anti-symmetric because yeah, if one number is less than or equal to another and another number is also less than or equal to that, then the only possibility is they are the same number. Yeah, yeah, Ren has a good comment here. For symmetric, think about equal, and for anti-symmetric, think less than or equal. All right. Let's end the recording here.